Hi everyone! My name is Taylor. I work in marketing here at Random House. I also recommend books on my own channel, Books with Taylor. Um, today we have a very special guest, Francis Cha, who is the author of If I Had Your Face. We will have Francis here in just a minute, but I'm going to quickly pin a comment to the top for anyone who joins in later. Um, in the meantime, feel free to introduce yourself, tell me where you're tuning in from, what you're reading, and we'll get in a second. Oh, and feel free to ask questions too. We want to hear from you. Um, we'll answer some of those along the way. And we should have Francis now. Hi, Francis. Hi. Hello. How are you? Good. Can you hear me okay? Very technically challenged, as you know. <laughs> <laughs> Taylor has we been got happy. It. Yay. Um, so for those of you who are tuning in, this is Random House Live with Francis Shaw who is the author of If I Had Your Face. I finally got my copy of your book, Francis. Oh, yay! Glad to hear this. <laughs> Do you want to start by telling us a little bit about your book? Um, yes. So I have my copy here. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us. And this is my book, If I Had Your Face. <laughs> I see all the messages popping up. It's so distracting. <laughs> you can also just zhuzh them down, and they should kind of condense a little bit. Um, but I'll have oh. conversation. Oh, you don't have to worry okay. about it. But, yeah. Um, so my book is based in contemporary Seoul, and it follows four narrators, actually five young women, but four narr narrators as they are trying to carve out a life for themselves in contemporary Korea. And it's such a, such an extreme society that they have to resort to kind of more unusual and very practical means to survive. And they rely on each other um, through a lot of it. And you would think that I'd be better at talking about this <laughs> by now. <laughs> but it came out last week. It's difficult. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a really wonderful book. Um, and as you know, Francis, this series is called Writer's Routine. So I'd love to hear about your process and, and your routine for writing this book. Yeah, it was really fun to kind of try to summarize it for Random House. We had a an Instagram post go up um, a few days ago about my writer's routine. But there's really no routine to it, actually. <laughs> I just take my computer everywhere and plop down whenever I can. And it took a lot of uh, practice and training in my day job um, as a journalist to really get to that point where I could sit down and start writing whenever. And a lot of desperation also brings you there as well. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I... I love to write in the morning and I really have to have absolute silence these days. It didn't used to be that way. I used to be able to write in a diner um, with, you know, pop music blaring at, <laughs> at full um, sound. But now I have to have complete silence, a lot of drinks, a lot of snacks. And in Korea, I go to this place called a Tokusashi, which is a 24-hour study cafe. And a lot of the kids are, a lot of the people there are studying for the college ent entrance exam. And so I kind of, I sneak in there and try to, you know, <laughs> try to concentrate when, and I can feel the burning fervor of everyone around me, and that's very inspiring. And in the States, uh, pre-pandemic, I would write at home in the morning. And then when my kids come home, um, I, I have a few more hours to work. So I go to uh, a writer's space in Brooklyn. And then it, I write there. And they also have free snacks and drinks, which is very important. Amazing. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we love snacks and drinks. <laughs> Writing process. Um, so a lot of your book is about one of your characters who's um, a, a, sol a room salon girl. Can you tell us a little bit about what that means and maybe some of your, your research into that whole world? Yeah. So I didn't set out when I first started writing. Well, okay, backtracking. <laughs> but the first time I went to a room salon was completely by mistake. And I wasn't meant to be there. 
um, the guy who had caught me there was a good friend of mine and he was very drunk and he was not supposed to, to call me there. But for those of you who haven't read the book yet and they're, you're not familiar with the concept, a room salon is a, is an, a very Korea specific underground hostess bar. And my storyline has to do with a Tenpro, which is like one of the top 10% um, room salons. And yeah, the chapter that opens with a girl entering a room salon, it's kind of based on my own experience because um, I went to my friend who was at a room salon and he started speaking to me about his own problems and I was speaking with him and it was actually quite a little bit of time had passed before I realized that I wasn't in a normal karaoke bar setting and it was it was an unusual place and then once I realized I became absolutely fascinated and I refused to leave (laughs) even though everyone (laughs) who also realized that I wasn't supposed to be there was now kind of freezing me out and staring daggers at me and uh, like really wishing me to leave. And so once I discovered that world, I became so fascinated. And the other way that I would routinely encounter the women who worked there was by going to my hair salon. And again, I didn't realize this until I was aware of it, but many of these women who work there have a standing appointment at a hair salon every day and I would um, encounter them sometimes and they would have a special package that they're taking advantage of. And I, I often ask my stylist, Oh, how come I don't get that rate? And they're (laughs) like, Oh no, 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 that's only for Onni, which Onni is like a sister. It's like a slang for sister. And, and I would see them getting ready to go to work. And again, that became another storyline in my book because one of my characters is, a hairstylist who's very dear to my heart. Yeah. The other part of your book that I found so fascinating was kind of this exploration into the world of plastic surgery, which is so different in Korea um, and the U.S. It, the, the perception's totally different. The practices seem very different. Do you want to talk a little bit about that research and, and kind of those two different perceptions? Um, yeah. So... I mean, it's it's been very interesting to field interview questions about plastic surgery in Korea because I feel like the the questions I get from um, the more American perspective is assuming that the lens is one of kind of judgment and uh, you know it's a it's a different it's a different look at why people choose to have plastic surgery and I would invite the reader to reserve judgment um, because the I think the more Western perspective is to, you know, think that you shouldn't have to change who you are um, for anyone else. Mm-hmm. And you shouldn't, you should be very happy with how you look. And of course, that's a very, that's a wonderful sentiment, which I completely agree with. But at the same time, I think, um, hopefully if you read the book you'll see that there are people who do it for different reasons and more practical reasons and for life-changing reasons and I would hope that you wouldn't judge them so harshly um, just purely based on the fact that they get plastic surgery that's what I wanted to explore um, in the book and for research uh, for over the course of several years I went to several different clinics Uh, kind of posing as a future patient and I got my face you know 3d mapped and x-rayed and had many consultations with the different clinic managers and the surgeons themselves and it was very interesting to hear how they would immediately pinpoint what I'm insecure about already and they'd be like oh this is how we can change it and (laughs) they would present me this um this plan and it was really dramatic mm-hmm. very tempting 
<laughs> but again, just it was very fascinating to speak with the clinic managers, especially because they have a very different attitude to the surgeons. And it's more like, a, oh, let's sit down and, and have a little gossip about, you know, your life and what you want. And I can tell you all about my life and everything I've had done. And I can tell you about even procedures that are not offered at this clinic. Mm -hmm. And I'll introduce you to other clinics um, because we're all one big network and, and a big happy family. So yeah, it was it was interesting to do that kind of research. Fascinating. Um, and so again, this is Random House Live with Francis Cha, who is the author of If I Had Your Face. Um, I also I love the cover of this book so much. I think the pink is is amazing. Um, what was that? What was the cover design process like for you? Um, I I wanted to have. A Korean person, and it was very important to me, of course, to have an authentically Korean person yeah. on the cover. And I, it was so shocking. I loved having, I think we had 10 different, maybe more, uh, completely different versions of the cover. And I, it was, they were all so dramatically different from each other. Um, and it, it varied from, um, I would say more, more literary, more dark, and then more pop culture, and this was ultimately what we landed on. And I, I really love it too. It's so good. <laughs> and, and so this book is about these these four different women whose lives kind of all intersect at various points. How did you handle writing from multiple multiple perspectives and kind of splicing them together? Mm -hmm. I actually thought it would be a group of interconnected short stories in the beginning. So I wrote them very. I would always be in a very different um, brain space when I was writing each story. And kind of, and I would, I guess the way that maybe actors get into the method acting or whatever. But if I'm um, continuing one character, then I just think about that character for an extended period of time. And um, in terms of read, I did a lot of reading um, to see how different writers handle the multiple first-person narrator POVs. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite books that, that handles it so well is Charles Baxter's Feast of Love. I don't know if you've ever read it. I haven't, no. You give me really the best book recommendations. <laughs> yeah, I, I hope you will check it out. But that one handles, um, I think, five five or six different points of view so beautifully. And I think mine, also the Joy Luck Club, of course, has been, and I wrote an essay about it recently, such a benchmark for how to handle uh, multiple first person female narrators. Yeah. Well, and something that you and I have also talked about too is how this is definitely the first novel that I've ever read about contemporary Korea. Um, and there don't seem to be many others out there. So what, what is that like as an author and where do you find inspiration from, from other writers and what other books do you look for? Um, I, yeah, it's been really interesting. I was actually talking to Kevin Kwan the other day over email because I think he faced this uh, writing a book about contemporary Singapore for you know, for a lot of people, it was the first book that they had read about contemporary Singapore. And the questions that he faces um, in interviews regularly are also very, like, political and and all these um, angles because people are excited to talk about contemporary Asia with the writer. I've And I also have been... Um, it's It's been really wonderful to see the reception of people who haven't seen contemporary Korea in a novel before and they they are texting me or tagging me in real time saying, oh, this is so interesting and strange and, and cool to like see all the things that are in our lives be featured in a book. Right now, I mean, I read a lot of Korean fiction in Korean language. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's a very different experience from having to contextualize it for an international audience in English. I think what the 
So Kim Ji Young, um, born 1982, which actually came out in the States the same day as my book. I really highly recommend that book because it's such an incredible, incredible novel. One of my favorites that I read uh, last year. And that also showcases contemporary Korea. Yeah. Um, but it's more a very, I don't know, more of a um, extremely feminist book, which has inspired a very uh, ex an extreme response in Korea. So I'm curious what American readers will think of it, not coming from that. Mm -hmm. So I have one last question for you, and then I'll let you get back to your day. Um, but do you have any tips for aspiring novelists and other debut writers out there? Oh, yeah. Well. For me, the most helpful part of writing was having a weekly writing workshop. And it was just three women, including myself, and we would meet every single week at the Center for Fiction. And each person had to submit at least 10 pages. And we would sit down and critique each other's work. And a weekly workshop is really intense. Um, and I think once you commit to that, and I don't think any of us missed a workshop for a good, I would say, four months straight. So that is really effective, just having that commitment and um, deadline and the, the knowledge that other eyeballs are going to be on it on a regular basis. But at the same time, because it's a novel in progress, you don't, like, it's, it's hard to workshop if you're in a, in a larger workshop where you're handing something in every three weeks or every month versus um, every week. So yeah, I would really recommend that if you can find um, so much to do. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. I hope that all of our thank viewers will go out and get a copy of If I Had Your Face. It's such an incredible read. I highly recommend it. Um, and thank you so much, Francis. This was so fun to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you for joining everybody. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye.